Uh, my name's Joe. Uh, I wear this shirt every day of my life, evidently. And um, I am the congregational care lead here at Wellspring Church. And what that means is that if you call Wellspring home and, and something bad happens, you might hear from me. And I'm going to do what I can to help make that better. Um, but uh, something about me is that I like to snowboard. Um, I grew up in the Arctic north of New Jersey uh, in a town called Vernon, and we have the biggest ski resort in New Jersey, which isn't saying much because there are way better ski resorts out there, but uh, that's my hometown, and uh, I didn't really learn how to snowboard growing up. It wasn't until I was an adult that I started learning, and uh, it's something I get to share with my son, too. It's, it's a really fun hobby, but here's a video of me and him uh, just a couple weeks ago. Keep going, you're doing great. What? <laughs> I never said I was good at snowboarding. Um, I learned as an adult, I didn't really, I spent my teen years like playing video games and being a nerd and doing musical theater, but snowboarding was not something I did growing up, it was when I was an adult. Um, I have another video here of, of what, what happened last year, you can see how Parker kind of progressed. That's my boy. Oh, my boy! Father <laughs> Despite my best efforts, I'm not a good snowboarder, and I had some trouble stopping there, and I was trying to help Parker, and it was not a help at all. I just dragged him down the mountain. But the reason he's so much better at snowboarding this year than he was last year with me dragging him down the mountain, is uh, because of my brother, Dan. And he was the guy who recorded that video, and you can hear him laughing because that was hilarious. And he's the reason I learned how to snowboard. Um, he's, he's way better than I am. Um, when I was 17, Dan was 15, and he was in a dirt biking accident, and he lost his leg. He was given the choice to try and save the leg, which is a very unsure thing. They weren't sure if it would even work, or to amputate. And as a 15-year-old, what do you do when you're given that choice? His chief, most foremost concerning factor when making that decision was, will I be able to snowboard? It was the first thing that came out of his mouth. And he was assured, yes, you can snowboard. There are people who, who do this with uh, missing limbs. It's, it's possible. So he said, OK, let's do it. The next day, he went into surgery and was officially an amputee, and he was very bummed that he could not keep the amputated leg. Um, still, still a regret. Only half of you are laughing, and I assume <laughs> the half of you that are have seen a Christmas story. It would have been a great conversation piece. <laughs> but anyway, um, he, he goes to rehab for, for a couple months to try and heal up. There were some complications. Um, and all the time, it's on his mind, hey, I want to get back on a snowboard. So he has complications and, and trouble healing. But finally, he gets out of the rehab, and he's able to go home. But he still has to recover. His leg still isn't healed enough to put on a prosthetic leg. But all the while, he's saying, hey, I want to get back on a snowboard. So time goes on. He goes to therapy, and, and he gets fitted with his prosthetic finally. It's, he's healed enough for that to happen. And... Um, Still, more setbacks. He, he, he gets this prosthetic leg, but it takes time to, to learn how to walk again when you're missing a foot. So he, uh, he basically went around on crutches and uh, sort of hobbled around, not really being able to walk. All in his mind is, I want to get back on a snowboard. And then winter comes, and he can barely walk. But he said, hey, winter's here. It's time to get back on a snowboard. So he goes, he hangs out with his friends, he can barely walk, and it turns out he's better on a snowboard than he is at walking at that point in time. It's an inspiring story, but it, it doesn't end there. Time goes on. My, my parents sent him to a camp for adaptive snowboarders and skiers, people who are missing limbs, people who are uh, paralyzed, are able to go to these camps and experience skiing and snowboarding when they normally wouldn't be able to. So he goes to this camp, and 
he meets all these people, and some of these people were like, hey, um, we have connections. You can be a competitive adaptive snowboarder. Would you like to train for this? And he's like, yeah, sure, I love snowboarding. Let's do it. So my parents help him for over the next couple of years to train. He trains, he trains, he competes. He wins some stuff, but there's still setbacks. There's financial setbacks. He didn't know where the money was coming from when he set out to do these things, but God provided. He had issues with his leg going forward, and still he was able to get by. And finally, he got the chance to uh, audition for the U.S. Paralympic team, and he made it. And in 2014, he got to go to the Paralympics in Sochi, Russia. And it's a super huge accomplishment. He didn't place or anything, but you can go look up on YouTube, like the videos and stuff. Um, but it was a goal for him, and he made that goal. All the while, he faced challenges. And it's a really inspiring story. We can, we can sit here and we can see the end goal. We can see how he succeeded, but all the while, he had these setbacks. He had these challenges, but he remained focused on that goal. He faced it with resolve, even though he had setbacks. You know, in life, we don't get too many. Oh, here's another picture of him um, at competing in the Paralympics. Uh, he's, he's, he's pretty good, way better than me. But in life, we, we, we don't always get good news, right? If you were 15 years old and, and, and you were faced with the choice of losing a leg, what would you do if you were in his shoes? Or shoe? <laughs> there, all right. Took a second. We got it. Cool. Um, what, what would you do? What, what would you do if you were faced with this life-altering decision, with this grim, bad news? And throughout life, there are all these different things that come at us. And like, we tend to come to church and focus on being like super happy, yay, Jesus people, woo, that's us, right? But we live in a fallen world. And the challenge is knowing how to live in a fallen world well. We're in week four of Called His Shot. This is a series where Jesus uh, is talking about his own death, burial, and resurrection. He's telling the disciples about how he's going away soon. They're not going to see him anymore. And last week, Pastor Dave Ritter, he, he went through three different occasions where Jesus told his disciples, hey, I'm not going to be here on earth too much longer. You guys need to prepare. And it's the same in John chapter 14, which is where we'll be today. Jesus is once again preparing his disciples for his departure. Uh, if you would please stand for the reading of the text today. In John chapter 14, verses 25 through 31, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let, your, let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, but he has no claim on me. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. You can have a seat. So where are we? This is happening on what's known as, in some traditions, Maundy Thursday. And it's a solemn day. It's a day right before Jesus goes to the cross. The Last Supper has already happened. Judas has already left to betray Jesus. And in the entirety of John chapter 14, Jesus is preparing the disciples for his departure. He's saying, hey, I'm not going to be here 
anymore. And you can see this in John 15 and 16 too, the same theme. Jesus saying, hey, this is the last time we're going to be together. I need to tell you some things. And so Jesus is painting a picture of what's to come. And in this whole passage, the, the key point I want to bring out is this, that when life looks grim, choose peace. We're not always given the best news or options in life, but Jesus gives us exactly what we need to push through and give God glory. And you can choose peace. It's a possibility. It's nearly impossible on our own to do under our own strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can accomplish anything. I want to take a look uh, at verse 25, dig deeper, and uh, see what Jesus is, is talking about here. Verse 25, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. These things Jesus has been talking about are, are, are just that he's leaving. He's going away. He's not going to be here anymore. He needs to prepare his disciples because pretty soon, they're going to be alone. They're going to be on their own. Jesus is not going to be with them any longer, except they won't be. Jesus says that the Helper will come, the Holy Spirit. And uh, the Helper is a weird word, right? Because when we say a Helper, we think of someone who is subservient to another person, to assist someone who is greater. And that's not the Holy Spirit. So who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is not a thing. He is a person, and he resides on the inside of you and me. He's not the force. He's not, he's not a physical force. So I went to a Pentecostal Bible school, and I saw a lot of that, and uh, it, that was another joke, but it fell flat. It fell f just as flat first service. <laughs> I tried it again. I, I knew that this one was not a good joke, but I tried it anyway. <laughs> he's not the force. He's not some energy, right? Uh, Jesus said he's our helper, but he's not our butler, right? He's not, he's not this guy. As awful, awesome as Alfred is, uh, the Holy Spirit is not Alfred. He doesn't give us coffee or make our beds. He's not a virtual assistant, my son loves this thing and had like at home he plays music on it all the time, right? That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit isn't going to play us a song. It's not going to give us a report on, on the weather. But here's an excerpt from, excerpt from a, um, uh, a commentary I want to read to you. And it tells better who the Holy Spirit is. And it says this, from exalting Jesus in John. The Father will give them another helper. He calls the Holy Spirit the counselor. The Greek word is paraclete. And since it's only used in John, it's tough to nail down a precise definition of this term. It's translated helper, comforter, advocate. Some translate it literally as the one who comes alongside. And the key to understanding this term is to look at the word Jesus uses right before it. He promises the disciples another paraclete will come. Another means they currently have a paraclete. The Holy Spirit will come and fill the role that Jesus has been fulfilling with the disciples. He will comfort, strengthen, and teach them, just as Jesus has been doing all along. Right here, the day before he goes to the cross, Jesus is there with them in the flesh. And for the past three years, the disciples have traveled alongside Jesus and watched him perform miracles, watched him heal the sick and raise the dead. Do all these things, all the while teaching and comforting and guiding. And tomorrow, they will say goodbye to him temporarily. Even today, Jesus is not here in the flesh. It's the Holy Spirit that resides in the hearts of men. It's the Holy Spirit that empowers us to get through the day. And if you call yourself a Christian, one who follows Jesus, that means that the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. And if we listen to his voice, he helps us, he guides us, 
He advocates for us. He comforts us in our time of need. And he allows us to do things that are impossible in our own strength. And this is true for what Jesus talks about next in verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Jesus gives us peace. It's the Holy Spirit within us that allows us to experience that peace. And what, what is that peace? Why, why is that peace important? And Jesus specifies that, that his peace is different from the peace of the world. Uh, some people will find peace when they have wealth. If I get a lot of money, I'll have some peace in my life. I'll have less stress in my life. If I have job security, if I stay in this job, even though I hate it, even though uh, God, I know God doesn't want me here, he has something better for me, I'm going to stay here because having a steady job will give me peace. Maybe it's guns. Maybe if you have the right amount of firearms in your home, you can sufficiently protect your family in the case of an intruder. That will give you peace. Maybe it's possessions. Maybe your car is breaking down constantly. I drove those cars for a very long time. I know how it is. <laughs> Having a new car will give you peace. You don't have to worry about this one. Or maybe, maybe it's, it's possessions, right, if, or, or, or experiences. If you can set aside the time to go on this perfect vacation, you can have peace. Maybe it's promotion. Maybe you are set or making yourself look so, so, so good, which... In our culture, that is kind of what you do. Make yourself look better than you are. If you can make yourself be look better than the other people around you, you can get promoted. Then you can have peace. None of these things are, are evil in and of themselves. In fact, most of them are, are necessary for daily life. But if we put our trust in these things and allow these things to give us peace, they will fail. Money goes away. Jobs go away. Vacations end. Where is your peace when those things are gone? If we derive our peace from these things, we will be let down. So Jesus says this, Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Why? Because the peace of God supersedes fear. It supersedes fear. Despair. Despair can't exist in the presence of God's peace. Even in the midst of the darkest points in life, God's peace will persist. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we need to choose God's peace. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the disciples needed to choose peace over the coming despair. Let's continue on, verse 28. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. This is kind of backwards thinking, right? You wouldn't celebrate when a friend leaves town forever. In fact, in our culture, we, we really don't do that at all. We want to keep people around because we, we love our friends, we love our family. In fact, the only time we do celebrate when someone leaves is um, when it's that certain person at work because, well, you love them because Jesus says you absolutely have to love them. Um, so that's, that's why. But really, when, when that person's going away, you're, you're kind of like, you're kind of like this video. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> you seem kind of psyched. No, I'm bummed. <laughs> But I wasn't bombed. I was stoked. When you hear that bad news about someone you don't like, it's kind of what we do. But in a way, Jesus wants us to embrace that. He wanted the disciples to embrace that. That, hey, I'm going away. Rejoice. I'm about to die tomorrow, but rejoice. What? It's backwards thinking. And it's something we can't really comprehend. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can. It needs to be embraced, just like his peace needs to be embraced through trials and, tribu and tribulations. 
Continuing on, verse 29. And now I've told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. Jesus knew that there was some crazy stuff about to happen. He knew that the disciples would scatter at his execution. He knew that in less than 24 hours, Peter would deny even knowing him three times. In fact, uh, he says something similar to this in John 16. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. Jesus is saying, not only am I going to be killed, but the ones that kill you are going to think they're serving God while doing it. Jesus kind of gives them a death sentence of sorts. Say, hey, you're going to die. And that was a fact. Nearly all of the apostles were killed for their faith. Tradition says that, that um, most of them would have their lives taken from them while they were out doing the will of God. Peter was crucified upside down. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross. And tradition says that while he was dying, which took a matter of days, he preached Jesus the entire time. James was beheaded. But why? How? How do you know a fate is coming towards you, yet you march towards it with resolve? It is by the power of the Holy Spirit and the peace he provides. Verse 30, Jesus closes with this. We'll close this little section of Scripture. They go on talking, but you know, this, this little section of Scripture ends with this. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise. Let us go from here. Jesus says, hey, I told you about the paraclete, the comforter that's coming. I've told you about the peace that I give. Let me put it into action right here. The ruler of this world is coming for me. I'm going away soon. But he has no claim on me. Jesus exhibits this peace, even though he knows he's dying soon. With this peace, he carries out his mission with the grace and resolve that's required for it. Then he ends with rise, let us, let us go from here. He goes from presumably the upper room and starts his walk with the disciples towards the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus faced down his fate with holy resolve. He was about to be killed, yet he was at peace. I've talked about my dad before. That's me, my dad, my brother, hanging out at a Giants game. He really loved the Giants. And I've talked about how he helped as many people as he could. I've also, in other sermons, talked about how he died. He died of something called uh, ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. And over a span of 15 months, I saw him wither away. It's a disease that attacks your brain, it attacks your spinal cord, and, and degenerates it. And over time, you lose control of your limbs and the ability to speak and, and even breathe. That was his fate. What I haven't told you is that my grandmother also died of this disease. My great uncle also died of this disease. And in the past 10 years, researchers have found out that for 5 to 10 percent of the population that has ALS, it is genetic. I've been tested and I carry a mutation of gene C9ORF72. It's the same mutation that killed my father and most likely my grandmother and my great uncle. All current data shows that all carriers of this gene will manifest some form of ALS or frontal temporal dementia at some point in their lives. And given that my father and my grandmother died around age 60, chances are good 
that I may share their fate. This isn't worry. This isn't a sensational story that I made up. This is the facts of my genetic code. So a few times a week, these thoughts pop up into my head that I'm only going to get two-thirds of the average life. That I may be gone by the time my kids turn 30. The financial burden of what it is to have long-term care here in the United States your very real thoughts. So what do you do with these thoughts? What do you do when you have some life-changing information, the bad kind, and it's bestowed upon you? Do you give in to despair? There are many that do. People who are in my shoes who, who have someone who died of ALS and then they know they are a mutation carrier. Some have gone as far as to commit suicide because they can't handle the burden. They can't handle the stress that comes with that. There's no cure. There's no hope. So why wait for the inevitable? Thankfully, I don't give in to despair because inside of me is the creator of the universe. Inside of me is the Holy Spirit who can empower me to do things that I'm not able to do in my own strength. I can embrace the peace of God. And it's something I get to do every single day. Every day I choose peace. Every day I get to be thankful that I'm 35 now, so I have a good 20 years before I need to be concerned about my health taking a turn. I have 20 years to prepare myself and my family financially. I get to cherish every day, but it's not in my strength, but it's only in the power of the Holy Spirit that I get to enjoy the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. But here's the cool part. Because I have this knowledge, I get to use it for good. There's been a lot of research on this disease in the past 10 years. And they're closer than ever before to a cure. And I get to take part in this research. A, a few times a year, I go to a university hospital. They draw my blood, they poke me, and they scan me. They do all these tests. Why? They're trying to figure out when and how this disease manifests. They get to use parts of my body to help find a cure. So yeah, I get to be a little bit of a science experiment. I get to be a living sacrifice of, source, of sorts so that not only myself, but other people might benefit. There are so many thoughts and, 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 and bad things that can invade my mind, right? But I walk with Jesus. And by the end of my life, there may be treatment. There may be a cure. So with this, I get to avenge my father's death. I get to be a living sacrifice for the good of others. I follow in the footsteps of my father, who helped everyone he could. I follow in the footsteps of Jesus, who faced his fate with peace and resolve. So once again, our big idea is this. When life looks grim, Choose peace. We won't always have this golden opportunity to choose peace every day. But when you get that bad health report, when you lose that job, when you don't get the promotion, I implore you to choose peace. When we put our trust in the things of this world and those things fail, our peace is stolen from us. Instead, engage in the peace that the Holy Spirit gives. And you may be thinking to yourself, yeah, sure, great, Joe. I, I, I'm not a superhuman. I can't just shrug off bad news like you can. I'm not a superhuman either. But the creator of the universe lives on the inside of me, and he empowers me to choose peace every day. And he empowers you to choose peace every day. Well, he wasn't one of the original 12 disciples. The Apostle Paul 
knew that something, uh, knew something about going through hard things in life. The guy faced death countless times. He was beaten, he was battered, he was bruised. He was exiled. He was shipwrecked. He he suffered all these things, mainly because of his faith and his mission. In the book of Philippians, he says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be made known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul's charge to those who are anxious, to those who are weighed down by life's burden, is to pray. Prayer is how we receive God's peace, the peace that Jesus gives. My challenge to you this week is to go to Corporate Prayer Night this Thursday at 6.30. There we meet up, we pray for one another, we bear each other's burdens as brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe you're new to the faith and and you, you don't know what prayer is, you don't know how to pray show up. You're going to hear a bunch of people pray. But as brothers and sisters in Christ, we lift up each other in prayer. And that's what we do on Thursday nights. Let's pursue the peace of God by casting our cares upon Him together. At Wellspring, we have these things called endless growth values. And then the one I want to highlight today is daily surrender. For me, choosing peace is an act of daily surrender. Maybe you don't have a grim fate befalling you. That's fine. You might just have some minor inconveniences throughout through your day. Choose peace. Choosing peace is always an option, no matter how hard. As Christians, we look to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him He endured the cross. He was our example. He carried out the will of the Father. All while while embodying peace, he stared down his fate with the utmost resolve. The disciples, they did the same. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I can too. Let's pray.